we're recording. Thank you. Seeing a presence of a quorum um, of the Community Resources Committee, I am calling this April 14th, 2022 meeting to order at 4.30 p.m. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to take a, a roll to make sure everyone can be heard and we can hear everyone and can hear everyone. So I will start with um, Jennifer Taub. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Uh, Pam Rooney. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke is present. And um, I do not see Shalini Balmilne yet. Um, Athena Jane Wald is in the audience. So can we bring her in? Um, into the meeting as we get started. We're gonna move right on to our agenda. The first order of business on our agenda is a public hearing. This is a, okay, at 4.32 p.m. Um, in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. Zoning bylaw article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance. To see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw by rescinding article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance, for the purpose of adopting a similar bylaw as a general bylaw. Um, we are going to use the public hearing process that was just modified in our rules of procedure for the town council. So we will start, the order will be board and committee member disclosures, applicant presentation. Um, so that will be either the historical commission and planning staff, questions from the committee, questions from the public, public comment, um, any response, or answers and then further questions from the board or committee. I want to state at this time that this is the hearing solely for the request to essentially move that bylaw from zoning bylaw to general bylaw. Once we close this hearing, we will go on to item 3A in our agenda, which is the proposed preservation of historic structures general bylaw. And at that time, we will run something similar to a public hearing, but not formally a public hearing. And that will include time for the public to comment on the actual language of the proposed bylaw in the general bylaw. Um, and so at this time, I'm hoping that everyone will keep their comments to the appropriateness or their thoughts and questions regarding the move from the zoning bylaw to the general bylaw, not the bylaw that has been proposed for adoption as a general bylaw. Um, so we will start with, are there any board or committee member disclosures at this time? Can we quickly confirm that Shalini can hear us oh. and be heard? She just joined. Thank you. Yes, Shalini. I am here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Shalini. Um, seeing no hands for board uh, committee member disclosures, we are going to move to, I'm going to recognize Jane first, if she would like to say a few words, and then we'll move to probably Ben, but maybe Chris on just talking about the move from zoning to general. Pam Rooney's hand was up. Oh, sorry, Pam. Totally missed it. You're muted. I was simply going to say at some point, it would be beneficial for someone from town staff to describe for the public uh, why one would want to go from a, a zoning bylaw to a general. And that's that's really all I wanted to say. That is what they will do yep. between Jane and whoever we recognize before we take questions. So Jane, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, Mandy Jo. I, um, so my comments may, uh, I hope, I hope they won't drift too far into the second agenda, <laughs> but I just wanted to give a little background on um, why the Historical Commission and Planning Department took up this uh, uh, 
bylaw examination in the first place. And so this goes back to about 2015 when the Historical Commission and the Planning Department began a kind of a joint effort to revise the current demolition delay bylaw and the zoning bylaw. Um, in the prior few years, there'd been a, a, a kind of noticeable increase in the number of demolition permit requests coming to the Historical Commission for review. And in many instances, the permit applications didn't, didn't necessarily touch on or, or address questions of historical significance, but as the bylaw was written and interpreted, the, the safest thing to do was to forward them to the Historical Commission. Um, so kind of realizing this circumstance, um, it seemed that a bylaw revision could uh, achieve perhaps three important goals. First, it would provide greater clarity about the goals, processes, and definitions to applicants, to, you know, in some cases developers, or, or in many cases, ordinary homeowners, so they, that they would know what to expect from a demolition permit request process and timeline. Second, um, this same clarity in definitions of terms could provide clearer guidance for the building commissioner in accepting and processing demolition permit applications that were related to historic structures. And third, um, we hope to, to tighten up timelines and waiting periods to provide better service to Amherst citizens. So in the course of our work with the planning department, we realized that a bylaw fitting Amherst needs would require a more, um, a more thoroughgoing reorganization to get to the kind of clarity that we thought would be most useful to the town. So our process included review of the bylaws of about 25 comparably sized towns in Massachusetts. We consulted a widely used, now widely used, bylaw template developed by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. We also held a workshop with staff of that historical commission on bylaw best practices and received much valuable and targeted advice. Um, in these past years, we've worked closely with the planning department staff and we've had um, the real benefit of uh, the building commissioners and planning boards review and commentary on uh, a few occasions. So we think this has been a good and thoughtful process and we're pleased that this is now um, on your desk. Um, and I think maybe I'll just stop there for now and um, come back if I'm needed. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. And yes, you're, you're welcome to stay through the agendas, all the agenda items that deal with the whole process, not just the hearing, obviously. Um, and so, yeah. And Ben, are you going to give the brief overview as to the reason for the move? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I had um, prepared a presentation, but I'm realizing that's probably better suited for the second uh, agenda item when we get into the nuts and bolts of the proposal. But I will just show this slide that has the rationale for moving from zoning or from zoning to general bylaw. So bear with me here. So um, I echo completely what Jane said, just in terms of process and um, you know where we are today. And you know, I'm definitely pleased to be have moved this bylaw uh, since you know I started with the town two years ago, working with the commission and on this bylaw revision into to where we are now. So a lot of work has gone into it. Um, and so I would say. A big part of uh, the proposal is moving from general to zoning, as well as, or sorry, moving from zoning to general bylaw, as well as some of the more substantive changes. Um, so I'm, you know, glad we're having the opportunity to look at that closely and um, hold the hearing just about that move. So, um, you know, in terms of rationale, um, you know, there's the first two bullet points, you know, essentially it's, you know, most cities and towns have this bylaw in their general bylaws. Um, so, you know, you know, one could say an applicant would, you know, they'd be more, in, if someone's new to town, they might be more inclined to be looking through the general bylaws to find information about demolition, you know, for example. So that might provide some clarity for applicants um, if they're, you know, uh, coming from another town and want to, you know, are assuming it might be found in the general bylaws. So that's one reason. 
Secondly, you know, the Mass Historic Commission, it's their recommendation that this should be a general bylaw. And they are the, you know, state experts on all things historic preservation, demolition bylaws. So, um, you know, I definitely want to take their advice closely. Um, you know, thirdly, we have the local historic district bylaw in town, um, and that is included in the general bylaws. And so, you know, this preservation of historically significant buildings bylaws, you know, fairly similar in, um, in what it regulates to that bylaw, you know, there's obviously differences, but um, I think they are both better suited for the general bylaws. Um, fourth bullet point, you know, a more um, tangible change would be that if something's in the zoning bylaw, the an appeal for that uh, zoning decision goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals. However, if something is in the general bylaws, uh, the appeal would go to court. Um, and, you know, I think it's our, under, you know, opinion that um, an appeal of a demolition um, decision or a, you know, dis decision of significance is better suited to go to court rather than the Zoning Board of Appeals because the ZBA is better suited to uh, make decisions on, you know, zoning, zoning matters, special permits, that those kind of things. Um, and then lastly, just um, in general, you know, as I think we all know, you know, zoning deals with, um, you know, types of uses that are allowed in a given district. It deals with development regulation overall. And, you know, while preservation of significant buildings is, you know, definitely part of zoning, it's maybe not a core focus. Um, you know, in a way it is a land use regulation, but it's also, you know, more about people's property rights and, you know, uh, a, a goal to preserve significant buildings in town. So we think it's better suited for a general bylaw than the zoning bylaw. So um, those were the kind of core reasonings for um, this change from general, um, from zoning to general bylaw. Um, and so definitely happy to elaborate any further if anyone has any questions or um, go from there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, are there any questions from CRC members? Um, Chris. You I would just like to point out that when we spoke with Joel Bard, we've spoken with him on a couple of occasions and he's our attorney from KP Law. And he's mentioned a few times that um, when he first came across our demolition delay bylaw in our zoning bylaw, he was surprised to find it there because um, in his practice, he has mainly found um, this type of bylaw in a general bylaw. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. Um, yeah, this is just more comment. It does seem um, unusual that the local historic district bylaw would be in general and the historical commission would be in the zoning. So that, you know, so it makes sense to have them in the same place. Thank you. Um, seeing no other hands, we're going to move to questions from the public. Um, and these are questions at this time, there will be an opportunity to make a comment um, about this, if anyone would like to make a comment, but if anyone has a question about the move from zoning to general, please raise your hand now if you are in the audience and would like to ask that question. Seeing none. Are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment on the proposed move from zoning to general? Seeing none, um, did the applicants want to say anything else in that wide range of comments before we move to final questions from the committee? <laughs> Not at the time. 
Seeing none, are there any other questions from the committee on um, this particular issue? Seeing none, I am going to myself make the motion to close the public hearing on zoning bylaw article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical and architectural significance. Is there okay. a second? Second, Rooney. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. We'll start with uh, Shalini. Yes. Pat? Aye. Pam? Yep. Jennifer? Yes. And Mandy is an aye. That is a unanimous vote to close the hearing. It is closed at 4.46. Okay, now for the, the main part today, <laughs> what we've actually been wanting, um, which is we're gonna move on to item 3A, which is the proposed preservation of historic structures general bylaw. This, because it's a proposed general bylaw does not require an actual public hearing, which is why it was not noticed as a public hearing. But the way I'm going to run this is um, similar to a public hearing. We're going to hear from the Ben, his presentation that he wanted to give the last time, but he's gonna give it now. Um, uh, we already heard from Jane about some of the reasons they started looking into this. Um, and then we will go to um, any questions the committee has, and then we will go to comments and questions from the public. And then after that, um, we'll come back to the committee and potentially begin a discussion. But what I wanted to say is, the Historical Commission meets on Wednesday, April 20th. And so I'd like to, I don't intend us to make any motions regarding recommendations today or get into exact any exact language changes we might wanna make, but I think we should take this opportunity to pose any questions or any proposals we might wanna make on language changes or, or changes to years or anything like that now so that the Historical Commission can discuss it at their April 20th meeting and we can hear from them and their discussions when we come back on the 28th, at which time we can have a fuller, robust discussion about surrounding the recommendation. That's, that's my hope for today and the 28th. Um, so with that, um, Ben, you've got the floor again. Great, thank you, Mandy. Um, all right, well, let me bring up the slideshow again. So the Jane covered a lot of the background um, and this um, I'll, I'll kind of get into a bit more the substance of the, the bylaw changes um, as well as some of the starting with some of the just overall goals of the demolition now preservation bylaw. So uh, just briefly, so we're all kind of on the same page and from members of the public who are in attendance, just an overview of the goals of the demolition what was once the demolition delay bylaw, which is now the preservation bylaw. So um, just starting off, you know, demolition of a historically significant building is a permanent loss to the community. So that's kind of just the, 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 one of the main, you know, reasonings here. So, and secondly, a preservation and adaptive reuse of a historically significant buildings um, provides many public benefits, whether it's, you know, the, a, a tourist coming to Amherst to look at the historic buildings or, you know, even sustainability benefits in terms of not needing to build a new structure altogether. You can reuse an, an existing structure that can save a lot of energy and materials. Um, and so essentially recognizing that a, a demolition is a permanent loss to the community, this bylaw authorizes the historical commission to essentially put a pause on an imminent demolition project and during that pause, a 12 month window to, to work with an applicant to seek out alternatives to demolition, whether that's adaptive reuse, restoration. If you're Barry Roberts, you can relocate a building <laughs> um, and, and, and the like. And you know, there's been also times where a, an applicant during that 12 month window, it, became, it becomes very clear that there's really no alternative and, and a, a, a demo delay can be lifted and demo can be allowed to, to uh, move forward within that 12 month window. Um, so just a, a little bit, how about the, about how the bylaw works? You know, when an applicant proposes demolition for a building or structure that's over 50 years or old, 
Um, first, it's determined uh, whether the building is significant or not using uh, criteria in the bylaw. And then secondly, whether a 12 month delay is appropriate uh, for the structure. So there's kind of that two step process built in. Uh, problems with the uh, previous demolition delay bylaw, um, there's some vague, you know, definitions in the bylaw. Um, there's, and that, you know, makes it tough for the building commissioner to do his job in terms of interpreting the bylaw. Um, there's a high caseload for the historical commission members. Um, you know, there's a, there's no way for staff to really um, filter out uh, buildings that don't need a, necessarily rise to the occasion of needing a public hearing. So as you'll see, there's a, a new kind of review step built in. And then secondly, um, this is maybe more internal to you know how town hall works, but th there's no distinguishment between the building uh, or demolition permit process handled in the uh, building department and then the historical commission review process. And because those processes are intertwined right now, it creates issues with um, you know, how noticing is done and also how these timelines work together. Um, so we're looking to kind of pull those processes apart with this new bylaw. Uh, I already did this slide, so moving from uh, zoning to general bylaw. Um, so now presenting the new preservation bylaw, um, here are some of the proposals uh, in the new bylaw. So firstly, um, I already went over this, the move from the zoning to general bylaw. Uh, secondly, there's kind of this new um, certificate process that's developed. So um, uh, basically, the you, your historical commission is your first stop, and you either you can be issued a demolition authorization or a preservation order from the historical commission, and then uh, your demolition authorization is your ticket to go get your demolition permit from the building commissioner. And so there's two different application processes. And it really uh, separates the, the these two uh, permits apart, um, which is our goal. And then thirdly, um, there's a two-step review process that we're proposing. Um, currently, uh, when an application is proposed for a building 50 years or older, it's pretty much automatic that there's going to be a public hearing. And at that public hearing, the commission first determines if it's significant. And then if it's significant, then is um, goes on to decide whether or not to put a delay on the building or not. And so one of our goals is to um, have a initial review process to first determine if the building is significant. And if it's not significant, there's no public hearing required. So it can, it can be issued much quicker um, and the applicant doesn't need to come to a um, public hearing. It saves money because we don't need to advertise the public hearing as well. So what we're proposing is a first, um, the historical commission can authorize a designee to um, make this determination of significance. Um, you will note um, one thing that came up just yesterday uh, with our conversation with Joel Bard is that when the commission authorizes uh, designees to make this determination, if it's uh, two or more individuals, um, whether it's a planning staff member or a commission and a commission member or two commission members, um, two or more would constitute a subcommittee and would thus be required to um, uh, subject to open meeting law. And so um, our goal was to kind of have that decision made quickly and not necessarily need um, to hold public meetings per se. So that's just one thing to consider uh, that came up yesterday. So, um, but I think we can, you know, find a way to work that out, um, whether, you know, and we'll discuss that with the historical commission at the April 20th meeting, um, but just something to keep in mind. Um, secondly, so then if a building is determined to be significant by this uh, individual or group of designees, um, it is then that's a public hearing is required to then, and that's the full commission to determine if a significant building should be preferably preserved, which um, uh, is a 12 month delay on the building. So that's kind of how the two-step process would work. Um, secondly, 
another big change was clarifying the definition of demolition. Um, so the current definition um, has some vagueness to it and it's kind of hard to interpret whether it's it really means only total demolition or it can include some of these partial demolition projects and that's been a um, it's been interpreted differently over the years so one goal of this bylaw is just to be very clear exactly what definite what demolition actually means um, and so there's a three-part definition you know it's not <laughs> It uh, became lengthier, I guess there's, but it's, I think it's more clear. So part A is initiating the work of total destruction of an entire building with the, or the intent of completing the same. So that would be total demolition. Part B is any act of pulling down, destroying, removing or raising 25% or more of the front, back or side elevations of a building. Um, and this A and B are fairly common in I would say A is the most common definition you see of demolition in, in Massachusetts uh, for this bylaw. B, I would say um, a good amount of towns have something akin to part B. Um, part C um, may be unique to Amherst. I've not seen this part C in, in many other bylaws. Um, and so the function of part C is really to be able to capture um, the act of changing, modifying, or removing important architectural elements from a building. So that could be, you know, changing out a, um, you know, windows, stoops, porches, chimneys, you know, similar elements to that. Um, that's something the commission um, felt strongly about and feel like it helps protect, you know, some of the unique elements you might find on a historic building. Um, I think I forget if we spoke about this at a previous meeting, but I'll just go over. Basically, um, we staff had some concerns about just the sheer number of um, applications that would create, because we are really talking about you know pretty fairly routine activities that someone would um, a homeowner could take on, you know, replacing windows, doors, porches, that type of activity. So we put this first sentence on here um, for buildings listed on the Amherst inventory of historic buildings accepted by a vote of the commission and updated periodically. So it's our goal is essentially to really narrow down the number of properties that, that this part C uh, might apply to um, and really just focus it on the most historically significant buildings in town. Um, I will say some of you might wonder what is the Amherst inventory of historic buildings um, and it in the at this point it does not exist um, it's something that will be developed over time um, with the work of the historical commission um, and so again I think we'll talk about this as a commission at our next meeting really to kind of focus on what is this inventory going to look like how it will be composed how it will be developed um, you know, there's a, I think it's open, potentially we'll be open to discussion, you know, whether maybe we wait on part C until we have a better idea of what this um, inventory might look like. Um, but I think there need, there's, um, we're going to uh, discuss that at our next meeting. And I will say too, the, uh, we have CPA funds and we're about to embark on an update to our historic preservation plan. We're gonna work with PVPC on that. So I think um, PVPC, they're really, uh, their folks in historic preservation are really experienced and I hope maybe over the year that we're working with them, they could help develop a better scope and framework for this inventory of historic buildings. But um, so yeah, I think, I'll leave that uh, part C there for now. Um, I see Chris has a hand up um, as well. Ben, can you just finish the rest of the presentation and then we'll go to Chris? Sure, yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm nearly done here. So um, just briefly, there's other items that were considered, but actually not really updated for the new bylaw. So the commission had a lot of discussion about, you know, what is that first threshold that um, triggers a need to look at the significance of a building. And so currently it's 50 years and the commission decided to stay at 50 years. So essentially um, buildings that are 50 years or older 
um, that are proposed for some type of demolition, whether that's total demolition, partial demolition, or removal of architectural features, uh, there needs to be some level of review about the significance of the building. Um, some towns use 75 years, other towns use a, a year and just, you know, uh, pick a year and say anything built previous to that is considered historic. Um, 50 years is what the National Park Service uses as their um, first, you know, threshold as, as denoting something as historic. Um, and again, the National Park Service um, runs the kind of the National Register of Historic Places. That's their involvement in this. Um, so they stuck, um, decided to stay at 50 years. Uh, the delay period um, stayed at 12 months. Uh, there was some discussion of going to 18 months. Um, Amherst bylaw started at six months, actually, when it was first adopted in 1999. And then I think in 2005, it was increased to 12 months. Um, there's some cities and towns that use 24 months, um, but the Amherst Commission decided to stay at 12. And then lastly, um, can a delay be lifted before the full 12 months has elapsed? Uh, yes, that, that can happen and does happen and will continue to happen in the, in the new bylaw. So with that, um, here are some nice pictures of historic parts of Amherst, and thank you all for listening and happy to clarify anything or, or um, answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. Chris. So I just wanted to note that there's um, the reference on slide number six is not correct. Okay. Um, we recycle these um, uh, slideshows, as you probably guess. Um, and there's a reference at the bottom of C. And um, the reference is correct in the text of the bylaw, which Ben oh, okay. will probably be um, going over with you. But the reference in this slideshow is not correct. Oh, you're right. Okay. No, awesome. no shame on Ben. It's just that, <laughs> as I say, these things change yeah, constantly. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Chris. Um, before we go to public comment, are there any initial questions from CRC members uh, before we hear from the public if they want to comment? Um, and then we'll come back to CRC members. Melanie. Yeah, I'm still not sure about the 50 years. Um, and I understand that it, the main commission or whoever has it as 50 years, but it almost, I mean, I wish there was a more compelling reason and what that might be. Otherwise, I also heard that anything prior to a certain year, that makes more sense, like anything above before 1960s, let's say, is historic versus, I don't know. That's the only question I have. Um, okay, Pat. Thank you. Uh, I, my question is very similar to Chalonet's. Um, I'm curious about the 50 years. Um, it feels like that gets us back to 1972 and it seems like it could affect an enormous number of structures in Amherst. Um, 75 years gets us back into 1947. So I have a, a little question about one building and its curiosity. Um, the, it's now Garcia's, but it was Bertucci's. Um, and that building, I believe, and I, I might have the story a little um, misaligned, but uh, that building, someone wanted to uh, demolish it and it was stopped because at some period, I'm assuming in the last 50 years, it was a car dealership, which, and there was nothing particularly, just as a resident, particularly interesting about that building. And a lot of people felt and I'm, that it was being designated um, historic to stop development. And I don't, I'm not saying that's why, because that's not a position I held, but it was a position that many people in the public held. So I'm kind of curious about how all this works and why the 50 year limit. Thank you, Pat. Um, 
We'll do Jennifer and Pam, and then we'll see if there's some answers to some of these questions since they seem similar. Jennifer. Yes, I hope <clears throat> this may be more of a, a comment than a question, although it is something I would, you know, maybe ask when the Historical Commission meet on April 20th that they discuss. Um, I'm concerned, particularly in light of um, what KP Law just said about open meeting law, that do we couldn't even have two members of the Historical Commission designated to determine if a building is historically significant, that it would just be one. And I would, I, I, I guess I'm confused as to why the whole commission, we have all this expertise in historic preservation and what's a historically significant structure on the commission. And it seems like too much responsibility just to maybe designate one person. And if the, if the idea behind it is that we'd be able to move more quickly, I guess I would argue for more thorough, you know, rather than quicker, because determining if a building is historically significant is really the purpose of the commission. And that, you know, if it takes a little more time, and then I guess echoing what Shalini and Pat said, if it would, you know, curtail a bit the uh, caseload if we, you know, did just look at buildings that were maybe 75 years and older. I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd rather, if for maybe expediency and to, you know, keep the workload reasonable, I would rather see just buildings that are, you know, maybe not 50 years, but 75 years and older, but have, you know, all the commissioners involved in determining that historical significance. That's my thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Pam. Thanks. Um, a question about um, one of the things that came up is, is who might be a designee for the historic commission. I wasn't sure who, who they would designate or who they would turn that responsibility over to. And, and then secondly, one of Ben's um, bullets was, um, raise the question if it if something is not deemed significant um, initially can that can that reading or that um, uh, assessment be revisited at some time during the process for that building if new information comes to light thank you thank you for that um, before we go to the public are there any uh, Chris Ben, Jane, would you like to respond to any of those questions now or just take them for um, the Historical Commission to, to think about and talk about at their next meeting? Chris. I think we can answer the first one of Pam's questions about who might be the designee for the Historical Commission. And that would be up to the Historical Commission to decide that, but among the choices would be one or more of the Historical Commission members and one staff member or and or one staff member from the planning department, presumably the person who is the staff person for the historical commission. So those would be among the choices. And I would also add, um, I, I think it was Jennifer who asked or had this comment. The uh, we uh, I just we added language and we're, we're proposing an additional language um, that I, I hope was sent out today, but um, that the designee or designees may request that the full commission uh, retain the authority to make the determination of significance. So if it's a, if it's a, I don't know, if it's a big project or controversial in any way, they they can kick it back to the full commission to make that determination. I don't know if that uh, solves all of the problems necessarily, um, but we thought that was important just for, as a kind of a pressure valve, if you will. Thank you. Um, I, I have some questions which have been touched on. I'm gonna save mine till after we hear from the public. Um, uh, so we're gonna move to public comment and question right now. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question, um, Pat looks like she's gonna say something first. <laughs> before I, finish I guess Pat. I would like a response to um, yep. The first two questions before oh. we move to public comment. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Any comment on the 50 versus 75 or the concern that Jennifer had of given that it's 50, 
and has to be a public meeting, is it is it is it serving its purpose? Number one and number two, the concern that keeping it only one to avoid a public meeting yeah. may, you know, like all that interaction. I don't even know how to say yeah. it, Jennifer, but but yeah, that interaction between those two. Yeah, I I've been I've been thinking about this bylaws like it has all these different levers you can push and it, everything affects a different part of the bylaw. So it it definitely it need it's not it's it's not a simple bylaw. There's there's complexities to it, and um, you know you add a little bit of workload over here, you can take some away over here, something like that. But I I do agree that the I guess confirmation we had yesterday from the town attorney about adding the you know that designee or potentially designate group of designees becoming a subcommittee does um, you know complicate things a little bit um, and maybe isn't serving the purpose that we wanted it to. Um, so I think I really, I don't know if we've had time to fully digest those implications. And I, I kind of wanted to bring it back to the historical commission to figure out if there's different levers to, <laughs> to push and pull uh, to change in light of that information. Um, Jane. Yeah, I, just to add a little bit to that, um, yeah, the, since this information has just come yesterday, the Historical Commission hasn't really considered it at, at all. Um, if So one other outcome of potentially having to uh, declare a group of designees as a subcommittee is that, that um, it, it kind of returns us to the same model we have, or a model similar to what we have now um where there would need to be a meeting to um determine significance and then either in the same meeting or at a subsequent meeting to determine whether a structure is preferably preserved um so we haven't that and that is actually one of the levers that ben is referring to and we haven't had a chance to kind of weigh the pros and cons of each combination of those uh, so I think that it'll be helpful for us to, to, to get to that. Um, I guess for the 50 years, um, that's, in a way, that's been kind of a longstanding um, criterion in historic preservation uh, and is, is widely accepted as the threshold for, uh, for considering, for uh, distinguishing something current from something historic. Um, and it's still, it, it is still a period of time that's widely in use. I can say that, um, I mean, the, the question about um, buildings uh, built prior to a specific year, um, I, I'm aware that that can be used in some bylaws and is, is used in some bylaws, but um, that introduces a, a, a difficulty with having to then periodically advance the year and change the bylaw, which seems like a sort of a, a bureaucratic thing that do, wouldn't necessarily need to happen. Um, and then finally, for the, uh, the Bertucci's example, um, the reason I believe that, that, um, that there was a demolition delay placed on that building wasn't because it had been used as a car dealership within the last 50 years, but that it was a structure built, I believe in the 1920s, and um, therefore was nearly a hundred years old. Uh, and um, some on the commission who know more about, I, I suppose, industrial design perhaps than, than, than I do, um, really pointed it out as, uh, an unusual building in Amherst. And so the goal, the idea there was not to, um, it certainly had nothing to do with trying to um, restrain development. I mean, the, the, the bylaw itself only puts a temporary hold on demolition that then can be lifted later. So that was not the goal. Um, and the, um, it was really the, um, the period in which the building was built, its design and function being 
somewhat unusual in Amherst. Um, so that, that's my memory of it. Thank you, Jane. We're going to move to the public now. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to make a comment or ask a question, and I'm combining them because there are two attendees right now. <laughs> so um, if anyone would like to make a comment or ask a question regarding the preservation um, bylaw as proposed, or, you know, there, there, I will say there is an update to it that was added um that we received today i i think it might have been able to get into the online packet in time i'm not sure it was i did my best to to forward it to at least the the committee members and all um and and all and if it's not in there already it will be in there soon um but yeah so if anyone would like to make a comment or ask a question regarding the general bylaw that has been proposed please raise your hand now from the audience Seeing no hands, we'll go back to um, committee members. I'm going to make a couple comments. I'm, since I, I waited, I'm going to make a couple um, now. Um, I also have concerns about the 50 year deadline. Um, and partially that's because nearly all of our major developments, or many of our major developments, residential developments in Amherst, are 50 years or older. Um, Echo Hill, Orchard Valley, Grantwood Avenue, lots of stuff up there would all fall under this. And so as I've heard some of the goal being to lessen the workload of the historical commission, putting it at 50 might not actually do that um, because so much of our residential housing stock is 50 or more years old. And so um, I think that would create potentially more work, especially as you look at if you're not having one person make that determination, you are now into multiple meetings, the entire commission, which is not, I, I'm not sure does save work of the commission. So I think I would love to hear from the commission how the new um, advice from KP law or, you know, ruling from KP law that says open meeting law would, you know, public meetings would have to be held if it's more than one person determining significance. How does that, what are their thoughts on how that relates to the 50 years or even having a designee. Um, one question I have there is, do you have to have a public hearing for determining of significance or would it just be having to be done at a public meeting? Can we save the public hearing if it's a two-step process? Again, just thoughts coming out on that issue because I know the commission's gonna need to discuss that. Um, Then my next question was, um, let me find, actually, I'll go to Pam while I find my next question because I have to scroll through a bunch of things. So Pam. Thanks, thanks. Um, just a couple, actually a couple of comments. Um, and I'm, I'm really delighted that, um, that the conservation, that it's deemed a conservation of historically significant buildings rather than demolition delay. I think that puts a really good spin on it. I'm, I'm really, pleased that that shift has taken place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I'm also, I'm, I'm also happy, and I, I know there are going to be questions that are raised, but I'm, I'm also very happy that the Historic Commission is feeling comfortable with this bylaw, with a new twist that just got added, which clearly needs some conversation because that, that affects every, every committee in town. Um, that I, you know, I, I look to the historic committee co commission to sort of be our eyes and ears for preserving and protecting and at least bringing to the forefront the importance of historic structures in town. So if you're comfortable with, with most of this um, and you're feeling that you maintain some um, ability to be vigilant in what you do, um, I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, I'd also like to send a message to the Historic Commission that let's get on that list of significant structures right away because um, that's a really good thing to have. Um, and then a comment about the, the, 20, uh, the 50 year standard approach for, for historic buildings. I, I think it's a little tough in a, in a town like Amherst, which was 
basically built up in the 60s and 70s, making, as somebody just said, um, most of our housing stock is, um, is now historic. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's always necessarily top quality or significantly um, important structures. I know um, there are so many split level homes that were built about the same time. So, so one would not be incredibly dis indistinguishable from another one. So I think that's something that I don't know that the, the workload too onerous just, just on that. Um, I'll just leave it at that, thanks. Thanks, Pam. Jennifer. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I know when I was on the local historic district commission that it wasn't from time to time we would have somebody come and they'd want to take down like a garage that was built in the 1960s or 70s. And of course, we'd say yes. And but it still had to go to the historical commission because if it was over 50 years old. And so if something like that, like a garage, which you know, you don't even have to spend time determining if it's historically significant, is that something you could just decide on quickly? going forward or um, that now get bogged down in the process? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to answer Pam's last question and your question all at once is, um, so just because um, there's a lot of the, the homes that are, you know, built in the 60s and 70s might be not, you know, not indistinguishable and, you know, not necessarily found significant there would still be um, staff time spent researching those properties for every application that comes in, whether it's partial demolition of, you know, a back a back wall or a side wall or something. Um, so that that's a concern is just the workload in town hall to even just look at all these applications, which could, you know, I, you know, you want to do it right and make sure that you're not missing something. Maybe there's a famous architect involved in one of these buildings or something, and you want to be mindful of that. So just the research involved in determining significance, you know, is something we, we don't take lightly. Um, and, and then, you know, wouldn't necessarily be kicked to the full commission. So it might reduce the commission's workload um, to have this initial review process, but it's still staff and potentially a commission member's time to look into that and do that research. Um, and to Jennifer's question about the garages um, and outbuildings, I guess they built in the '60s. Yes, they they would um, in the current bylaw they are um, subject to review by the commission. So in the current bylaw, they would go to a public hearing um, because that's how it's written. Um, in the proposed bylaw, um, it would be a review by this group of designees what and that would now be you know would be a public meeting potentially uh and let, if it's two or more so did that did that answer your question jennifer yeah i guess this my question is if it's there are like a garage in the 70s where you would the commission would just immediately vote yes you could take it down i mean it wouldn't be time consuming i'm i, I mean yeah. i would i would you know <clears throat> i would support be supportive of it being 75 years but i'm just hoping that some of these, I, I guess I'm just gonna call them no brainers that they don't take up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. you know, like a, you know, I'm thinking of a garage on Fearing Street that we let come down and I, it, we felt badly it had to go to the commission, historical yeah. commission, but I would hope that that would just be something that could be quickly decided. Thank you. Jane. Uh, just slightly tongue in cheek. Um, yeah, we, we have had applications for 60s and 70s garages come down and um, we've never denied the demolition permit. <laughs> uh, but really the thing I wanted to say was, um, uh, and this is a little bit thinking out loud, um, the, the commission, commissioners on occasion have um, uh, discussed kind of almost tangentially, um, these uh, these tract homes, these neighborhoods that um, are those developed in the 60s and 70s. And I think there, um, you know, the goal wouldn't be to, to want to um, delay changes to any single home, you know, to every single home in the hundred, you know, home 
neighborhood. The, I think what uh, historical commission members see in those developments is that it, it that that the entire development itself is a kind of a statement of a a period in um, Amherst's social and economic history. Um, but that's a, I mean, yeah, this is a good question. I'm, and I'm wondering if we, if there's a way to handle that separately. So that's, so that's one sort of end of that 50 year spectrum. And then on the other end, there are these very, you know, there can be very interesting buildings um, uh, that fall within those 50 years, such as, um, you know, kind of the brutalist architecture at UMass that, that are, you know, they're, they're pretty interesting and noteworthy and certainly have made um, a, a, a big statement in Amherst now because they are owned by the state. Uh, I don't think the Historical Commission would have any purview over them. It may be just informative. Um, uh, but that could, you know, that could be the case elsewhere. Um, it, but since I'm not aware of any, I, I won't take that argument any further. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. I'm I found my questions and, and one's more of a statement that I have concern, um, but, but I'll start with my questions, which are mostly in the enforcement penalties and remedies provisions. Um, I have concern that, that the commission, that this bylaw is drafted has the commission and building commissioner authorized to institute law and equity proceedings to quote, prevent a violation of the bylaw. That's like forward looking and, and that is a phrase that always worries me when a violation hasn't happened and we're, you know, what would, you know, like giving authority to someone to say, hey, we can sue you because we think you're going to violate something, you know, that because that's basically how I read that. So I've got real concerns about that one phrase um, within that section, section J1A. The demolition permit is authorized. I think that might be a holdover from prior. And so I just ask that it be looked at as to whether the demolition permit should even be mentioned at all. Um, uh, with Because it says something about subject to the bylaw knowingly performs a demolition without first obtaining a demolition authorization or a demolition permit um, is in violation of this historical significant bylaw. And so that that's where I get concerned because I'm not sure failure to obtain a demolition permit should put you in violation of the demolition historic structures bylaw. Um, and then the causative action, I just wanna confirm that section B says notwithstanding the section does not create an affirmative obligation to maintain a property, but section A says any owner that by some causative action contributes to the deterioration of said building um, is in violation of the bylaw. So does that mean if someone doesn't have the funds to maintain a building, they're technically in violation of it? Or does section B completely cover that to let them not be in violation of the bylaw simply because they didn't maintain it because that's sometimes some causative action. Um, so, and then finally just, a, so, so I'll, I'll stop there. And then the one thing I still have concern about is the determination for, for preferably preserved. One thing I hope for in bylaws is um, consistency, predictability, and I'm still struggling with the section on preferable preservation in that it just doesn't seem to provide any predictability or information to an applicant as to how the historical commission is going to make its decision on whether to preferably preserve a building. And I don't know whether that can be solved. I've had a lot of conversation with staff, but I wanted to mention that within this, this meeting that I still struggle with that because I want an applicant to be able to show up to a public hearing about preferable preservation and know what they have to say one way or another to avoid, you know, to obtain their demolition permit or not. Um, and that section that I read doesn't seem to help me. If I was an applicant with a 50 year old building in Echo Hill, I wouldn't know what to show up to that hearing about um, if it was deemed significant to 
attempt to be able to demolish the building or get my demolition authorization. And so I struggle with that particular section from a, you know, from a predictability from the applicant's point of view um, set. And I, like I said, I'm not sure it can be fixed, but I wanted to mention it during this portion. Um, Pam. Thanks. Um, I had one other question that came up um, and that would be uh, one of the sections is um, partial demolition is the removal of 25% of a wall or something. So would just hypothetically, if somebody came to put an addition on their 60s building, would the addition and the removal of a portion of that wall actually come, come to the building commissioner or would it come to the historic commission as a, as a first step? Do you want and to tackle, ta take Rob. that, Rob? Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what would happen is we, you know, the, the applicant would probably find out about this, the need to go to the commission by coming to the building department and filing that application. I think, um, you know, that'll happen on uh, almost anything in, in B or C of the definition. Uh, I don't think it'll be expected that there would be a historic review of anything other than a full demolition for a long time. Uh, so that that first stop would probably be with uh, my office, the permit administrator or a building inspector to and then be directed to the planning staff to uh, complete the uh, the application for the historic uh, review. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Before we move on, are there any final questions that people want to get out there? Um, we have the benefit of Jane there for potential discussion at the Historical Commission next week before we do this again in two weeks. See none. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Chris and Ben and Rob. Um, before you go, Jane, I, I want to say we were slated for the 28th, but we know that this open meeting law thing, if, if the Historical Commission cannot um, deal with it in one meeting. Um, I, I will work with you to make sure that we don't take it up till we have a recommendation or, you know, that the Historical Commission has heard and figured out how they want to deal with that part because I know it's there. So, so don't, you know, just I'll be in touch with Chris and Ben about whether we do do this on the 28th, if you guys have finished on the 20th or not. Um, so don't feel pressure because I keep saying the 28th, we'll, we'll make sure you have adequate time to discuss that issue. Um, with Thanks, that, Mark. yeah, and I noted the comment that this, uh, this is apparently going to affect, be have an impact townwide. Um, if anybody else is thinking of this model, but anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. With that, we're going to move on to item 3B on our agenda, proposed rescission of zoning bylaw, Article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance. This is the recommendation side. Um, I know we don't have the ability or we're not ready to make a recommendation on the bylaw in the general bylaw that has been proposed. But now that we've closed the hearing, I figured we might be able to make a recommendation on this one, um, on the zoning bylaw rescission, essentially. Um, any recommendation I would suggest, you know, we have with the hearing closed, we have 90 days to as a council to vote on the rescission portion without holding another public hearing. My suggestion is to a recommendation if we're going to recommend the move um, to the council is to recommend that that vote, even if it needs to be held within 90 days and the, his, the, the bylaw, the preservation bylaw and the general bylaw isn't quite ready, that the vote be, you know, upon adoption of a general bylaw, the zoning bylaw is rescinded so that we can take that vote within the 90 days to not hold another public hearing. But if we need more time for the preservation bylaw because of all these interactions and interconnections that we get that time without having to hold that public hearing on the zoning. Um, so with that, that, that's sort of my thoughts on how to do this without worrying about getting that recommendation out now. <laughs> Are there any other thoughts before we try to attempt a motion? or comments that people would like to put in me to put in the, um, you know, report on this, this part.
Seeing none, um, I'm going to try the motion, which is I move that to recommend the council rescind article zoning bylaw article 13 demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance with an effective date upon adoption or a, upon the effective date of adopting a general bylaw a similar general bylaw is there a second and second, i hope yeah, Angela was able to get that pat seconds that Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. Um, we'll start with Pat. Aye. Mandy's an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. That is a five to zero unanimous recommendation to move this from zoning to general. Uh, I believe that finishes, um, let me get this. Um, I believe that finishes all of the historical preservation stuff for today. Um, so thank you, Jane. And I, Ben, you might be done. I'm, I, Rob and Chris probably aren't, but I think <laughs> Jane and Ben are. Um, <laughs> we will, um, we're going to take up now the residential rental bylaw discussion on goals for revisions. So whoever's supposed to stay for that, um, stay on. Um, I know Rob's probably one of them, but I don't know whether Ben, you are. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Thank you all. But thank, thank you, you all, all for coming. Thank you, Jane, for your time. Um, so we're going to move on to the residential rental bylaw discussion on goals for revisions. Um, we're hoping to do this in about 30 minutes. Um, we're running, we're, we're on sort of schedule, which Pat's going to hate, not want me to say, but we're doing okay here. Pam Rooney, you proposed, or you wrote a memo to me based on all of that. We had, we're, we've got this discussion at the recommendation of Rob who wanted and thought that it would be helpful for us to sort of, as a committee, agree on some goals as we approach this revision of the residential rental bylaw so that we could always track back to those goals. Um, so Pam has a document um, that is in the packet. Let me see if I can pull that up um, once I find it. And, um, and Pam, would you like to say anything about this document before we just discuss it or? Um, sure. Just uh, it's it's a little lengthy, uh, and it kind of um, I don't I think know. one of the things that that we tried to do is to actually identify the issues that are that are trying to be addressed, and that's typically something that that we're always asked for is okay. So what are you trying to solve? What are the what are the problems? Um, and we um, I I hope everyone you know feels comfortable with the issues that that are listed here in the first section, the resident concerns that there are deteriorating properties, um, that we have, we have an inspection system now that's not um, sustainable because it's really just complaint driven and we don't get much um, financial payment for, for doing inspections. Uh, there aren't any penalties one way or the other. So we have a, we have a system that is kind of the honor system and uh, doesn't necessarily work. We also understand that the system, should we start to impose fees and structures, it needs to be equitable. And we and we know very clearly that there are that there are singles and you know a few uh, people that that own a few rental units as opposed to people that rent and own lots of rental units. And that we need to have a system that is absolutely supportive of owner occupancy and and small number units because that typically is something that provides a uh, an income for a family. Um, so with all the issues that are identified, then you know 
as a result of that, the, the need for a, an update was identified. And then we have the broad goal that the committee itself um, put together, which are ensure homes are properly maintained, adopt an equitable fee structure, create a clear licensing program and process, uh, safeguard strong neighborhoods and address climate action goals. So I don't know what else um, I need to say. Thank you for that, Pam. Um, so my hope is that we can turn this memo from Pam into some sort of issues and goals document. Um, so what I would like to hear from uh, CRC members and Rob um, and Chris and Dave, we want your input too, um, is, is we'll start with the issues section. Would there be, um, if, if we were turning this into a document that we could identify the issues with and then the goals, you know, the, those two kind of go together, goals and issues. Um, but would there be any, uh, are there any comments on the issues part of this document from committee members? Or Rob or Chris. So I'll make my my comments. I had three. Um, the first one was in the second bullet point. Um, I, I like keeping things as general as possible. So the 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 phrase potential long-term residents of working people, families, and retirees that Amherst says at once, I would just change to just potential residents um, because I'm not sure uh, disruptive behavior. I, I guess I look at what, what the building deterioration disruptive behavior is generally less attractive to any potential resident, not just potential long-term residents of X, Y, and Z. And so I would just make it more general. Um, the next bullet point down, inspection of rental properties that starts, instead of identifying occupancy limits, and I know that is a big concern of certain areas of town. Um, I, again, on the general side, I like saying things like um, building codes and compliant with building codes and zoning bylaws, because it's not just occupancy limits that we're concerned about in needing more inspections and all, at least in my, in my thinking. And then the third to last bullet point, the one that started resident reports that their streets no longer have a majority of long-term residents, so making connections with and engaging short-term renters is impractical. I, I would delete that. Um, you know, thinking about what was said by some counselors about, you know, how language comes comes out at our at the council meeting before this was referred, um, just because someone's a renter and short-term isn't defined, right? Short-term for many people is many different things. Just because someone's a renter doesn't mean they can't connect with people in their neighborhood. Um, and so I, I was very uncomfortable with that particular bullet point. And so I would, um, I would delete it because I'm not sure that's an issue that rental registration is attempting to address. Other thoughts on the issues part? Rob. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, in the bullets, let's say it's one, two, three, four, fifth and six bullets having to do with penalties and enforcement. Um, you know, generally, I don't I don't have any concerns about the issues uh, being described here. I, I just you know want people to understand that there are penalties, there is enforcement um, capabilities. It's really the issue is because we are a complaint uh, response uh, program that we're not actively out there viewing these violations and making enforcement, and all of this relates to the rental permit, not necessarily health and safety codes, which there is clear, strong enforcement capabilities once we're aware of it. Uh, so it's the kind of the lack of knowledge of these, uh, the conditions of these, these spaces. Uh, but, you know, for example, you know, no enforcement for failure to obtain a permit. That's not really true. Once we're aware of that, there is enforcement capability to ensure that a permit is uh, obtained. 
So it's, it's more about strengthening those two items with its respect to the rental permit, you know, staying in good standing or at the highest level of standing, depending on how the program is designed. Thank you, Rob. Jennifer. Um, yeah, well, I guess my comments aren't going to surprise anyone. Um, I would, I have, I think I would like to see occupancy limits remain. I know it's just part of the code, but um, that was really a driving force behind um, having rental permitting to begin with. And that's one of the most persistent violations. Um, and it's, it's a health and safety violation. It's, I mean, that's, I put it right up there. If we're gonna say safe, well-maintained compliance with occupancy limits is a part of that. And I don't have a concern about potential long-term, you know, uh, defining that in the second bullet, because I'm not saying this is a criticism to anyone, but honestly, if, if I were a, student to say it living in a house for eight or nine months um i wouldn't mind if there were too many cars in the driveway i'd probably be doing that myself when i had my friends over so i, I you know i don't want to get nitpicky here but i think that there are certain um things that happen that are problematic to the long-term residents whether they're renters or homeowners that are not um, a problem to more of, you know, uh, students in group houses renting for a short period of time. You know, and again, like the parking, that's that's one way you can tell, you know, kind of who a house is being rented to by the number of cars. Thank you, Jennifer. Dave. Yeah, um, I just wanted to make two comments. Yeah, I, I harping back to years ago when when we we did some of this work that created the rental um, program. The second bullet, disruptive behavior. I struggle with that a little bit, and I think it's been called out earlier. Is is whether is is that that may be an issue, but is that a is that a goal of this? of this effort. So I just put that out there. I'm not sure that inspections really address disruptive behavior um, in any way, shape or form. And then I think in the seventh bullet, you know, again, I, I um, this is your document, but residents reports that their streets no longer have a majority of long-term residents. So making connections with and engaging short-term rent renters is impractical. That to me, I don't know, just seems really kind of value laden. I think there are many, honestly, I think there are many neighborhoods in, in Amherst where uh, it is entirely owner occupied um, homes and I bet people don't know their next door neighbor. So I, I just, those are two thoughts I had, uh, thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, Pam and Pam. And yeah. then I was, I was going to talk about the bullet, the third from the bottom also. Um, the, the majority of long-term residents includes people who rent. We were a long-term renter in North Amherst for seven years. Um, and we were absolutely certainly part of that community. So we, we were there, we were long-term, we had a commitment. And I think that's what we're trying to talk about is is people who are here for a long, the longer haul than than the semester by semester, and I think of of any issue that we address in town with this with this uh, rental permit process, it is the sort of the behaviors and the the visible signs of I'll just call it neglect and and lack of engagement by the people who happen to be renting who exhibit that behavior. Um, as opposed to someone who, you know, puts in some roots, rents for a long time, or rents for a short time, but is engaged in the community. It does sound a little value laden as I say that, but it is, it is some one of the crux of the of the matter. It's one of the crux of the issues here. Thank you, Pam. Pat. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I, <laughs> uh, there are several houses um, near me that are rented to students. Uh, the one closest to me um, uh, has been rented for many years now by a group of students who were graduate students um, at the uh, engineering school. And they were here for five years each. Um, there were more of them, and I'm putting quotes around them, than were allowed. Uh, I think the home um, was a three bedroom home and there were five uh, residents. Um, two of them were a couple. Um, and I don't, so, so what we did with them was we made real connections. We did, and the house, the other house uh, on Pelham Road that is catty corner to us, that changes pretty much every year, although some of the renters um, come back and they add some new roommates. Um, that house has been a little bit more crazy, but the same thing that has happened is we went over and we made connections. So I never think that connections are impractical. Um, I have heard residents in my district say they were afraid to talk to some of the renters. Um, and that's a very interesting dynamic to me. Um, I don't know particularly what they were afraid of. Um, but that, that intrigues me a lot because I often think that our assumptions uh, make us afraid, uh, and that concerns me. Um, the, and, and I think Dave made a really important point. Inspections don't address renter behavior. And if there's neglect, it's really neglect by owners that we need to address. And I don't support an occupancy limit of three. Uh, my own son has been in violation of that when they, he and three of his friends from college moved on to graduate school in Boston. They rented a three bedroom apartment and he shared his room with his partner, um, Sadie, who 11 years later he married, but they were illegal uh, in, in this sense. So one of the things that might make it better if we increase an occupancy limit, there'd be less hiding, there'd be less, um, I don't know. So um, I think that we need to be really careful uh, about what we're trying to do and, and to try to be as honest as possible about what we're trying to do. I, and I will also say to the sponsors as an aside, I went on to State College Pennsylvania to try to find their um, bylaws about student rentals. And every time I got to the town's website, they, the page for the bylaws or ordinance weren't there. So if you have either a link that's active or can send me information, I'd appreciate it because I'd like to read a uh, look at that as well. Thank, Thank you. you Shalini. Yeah, I would also just come back to the question um, what problem are we solving for? And I agree with the quality and safety issues that are being highlighted. And um, regarding uh, the limits, I think it's sort of been said, but I'm just kind of repeating it in a slightly different way, that uh, when we put a limit on the house, um, then it, it actually makes it a social justice issue because when we allow, let's say we increase it from four to five, it's making the rent go a little lower and we're allowing more students to live in that house, which means also we're making other places available for families. So it's overall bringing down because it's solving some of our rental problem, the demand issue by allowing more people to live in. It's helping also bring the rent down. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to say. Um, and it allows the landlord, because he's getting more rent to do the upkeep, he or she. So I think increasing it is solving more of our problems the way we've stated them. And then the other thing about, yeah, the same street and losing 
we had a district meeting where people were concerned about more houses being converted into student rentals, student rentals and asking them, okay, what were the specific issues? In that particular area, they did not have any issues, but they were just concerned about losing family, single family homes um, to students. So that, if that, you know, and that's a, a discussion we need to have, but again, I don't think this particular bylaw is solving for that. So we need to be really clear about what are we trying to solve for and then provide solutions that um, go there. And I guess the last thing that's not in these issues is um, about environmental and climate change. And if that is something we're trying to incentivize, then I think that needs to be an issue that can be highlighted over here. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, the first thing is uh, we have an occupancy limit of, for, of four and nobody's requesting it to be lowered from four. Um, I don't even kind of know where to begin because the occupancy limit is four. Many have more than four. If we set it at five, there will be more than five. If you set it at six, there'll be more than six. They do not lower the rent. There were houses before the rental permitting, many houses on my street that were being rented to eight, one to nine students. They use the dining room. If there's like a den, they use a den. If it's an old house, they can close up the living room. They are charging the same. They're making, in an, if you have eight students, you can be making like $7,000. They are not lowering the rent. It's just, and it makes purchase, if we raise the limit, it makes snapping up these kind of starter homes, single family homes, that much more appealing because you can put more students in them. Um, there is on the 300 block of Lincoln, a very modest looking brick house. They divided it into first floor and second floor, although it only has one entrance and one address. There's three students on each. It's renting for $5,600. You would never know that if you passed it. Um, so I, I just have to, I know that's not what this, this is dealing with, but I just have to be very clear, increasing the limit, there will always be more people than what the limit is. And that's exacerbating every problem that people, I have to say, you know, I know Pam and I are, are probably of the five of us, the strongest on this. And that's because we live in neighborhoods, particularly in mine where hundreds of students, you know, charge down the street on weekend nights. If you don't, if you haven't experienced that on your street, you really don't understand what we're talking about. So um, this to increase the number of students isn't gonna solve a problem. It's gonna be much more lucrative for the property owners and it's gonna exacerbate all the problems that residents in increasing number of areas um, are experiencing. So I just had, I had to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Pam. Thanks. Um, I think Pat's example of, of reaching out to the neighbors who are renting is a really lovely example of how many, many of us tend to um, interact with our neighbors. And um, I think what we're trying to what we're trying to get at is that at a certain point on a street in a neighborhood, if there are more short-term rentals, then there are the people like Pat and her family who take the time to reach out to people. There, there aren't, there isn't a critical mass of the long-term caring residents to help the short-termers, I'll call them that short-termers, transition to you know part of the neighborhood. And it's so it's it's a it's essentially a matter of numbers and sort of the if, if um, someone just commented the other day, if, uh, if you look at Shumway Street, I think when I, was, when I was campaigning on Shumway Street, there was literally one home on the entire street that was still home, you know, was still owner occupied. The rest were entirely student properties. Um, I think when I look at this bylaw and I say, what are we trying to do? I think we are trying to manage um, sort of the health, safety, and well-being within the town, within this the purview of rentable housing. And and I and I want I want there to be when someone comes to invest in Amherst, I want there to be several stronger sideboards and and 
and guidelines for, you know, not just walking in, putting down your money and turning something into a, a very lucrative student rental. Um, I want there to be more st structure and um, responsibility placed on an owner. So people say, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's not quite as easy as we thought to just invest in Amherst and, and pop something into student rental. That's, that's one of my goals. I think the need to, the need to keep some housing stock available for purchase or, or rent by families, workforce, is, is really very, very important for the health of the town. So that's my spiel. <laughs> but that's, that's what's in my mind behind why I so strongly support something like this. Thank you, Pam. I'm gonna page down on this share to the goals to guide and inform revisions and see if we can, um, if there's any comments about that one. I know, Jennifer, you did have your hand up, um, but I thought I'd put this one on um, so, so that you know they're, they're similar to the issues. Um, and, but I wanted to hear if there were any comments on these particular ones too, as it relates to you know these words themselves, but also what we've been talking about. Chris. Um, I just wanted to comment on the equitable fee structure. I wanted to caution um, the members not to um, raise the fees on some of the well-managed um, multifamily developments, because I think, you know, when they're well-managed, which most of them are, as far as I know, um, they really cause fewer problems than some of the single family um, rentals. You know, if you have a single family rental and the manager is not nearby, I think you're going to run into more problems there than you are with, say, you know, a development that has, um, you know, a structure of management and certain requirements for their tenants. And so, I'm just cautioning you not to, you know, have the differential between um, the rental registration fee for the single family house to be that much different from a development that has, you know, many more, um, many more units because there may not be, um, there may not be a connection between how many more units there are and how many problems there are, that's all. Thank you. Um, Pat. Yeah, I want to echo what Chris said and also to say that in District 2, we've had neighborhood meetings and the managers from uh, rental uh, properties, particularly the larger ones, were involved in those meetings and directly uh, worked with their tenants uh, to be clear about what the guidelines were. And we found there, there was a great deal of change in in uh, how um, residents behaved. And I'm gonna put quotes around how residents behave. But uh, I also wanna say to Pam and, and Jennifer, I'm not, I have some of the same concerns that you do about workforce housing, et cetera, but I don't see how uh, even if this, these, all these changes were made, it would increase workforce housing because we're a capitalist society. And if, if I want to make money, then that's what I'm going to do by renting it out. Um, my, concern, my concern will always be, are we labeling people and limiting people from engaging with each other or engaging with the community? I'm really grateful for a lot of the students who volunteer throughout the town and stuff. And, um, I think we need also to call out the university uh, because they have done very little to address student housing um, and over time and you know they've increased the size of the university without changing. The other thing is UMass is downtown. Of course they're going to be hundreds of students. <laughs> Rampaging, and you didn't say that word. <laughs> um, 
but and and that's not okay when it gets crazy like blarney blowouts and stuff like that it's just not but that's not due to students renting homes and trying to go to school here and working here and and volunteering here thank you pat shalini Wait, did Jennifer want to respond to something or should I go? You you may go, Shalini, and then we'll take Jennifer. Okay. Um, so safeguard strong neighborhoods. Again, I think it's a similar idea. Encourage respectful behaviors. I don't see how this um, bylaw is promoting that. And um, again, with respect to creating more workforce family housing, I think we need to focus on zoning and how to incentivize. I think there are ways to incentivize local developers who really care about a community and, uh, and to focus over there. Like that's more preemptive and promoting housing of certain kind for alumni, seniors, you know, the kind and start a home. So I think working there would be a more positive impact than being punitive over here. Um, UMass taking more responsibility, and I may be wrong, but my understanding is that UMass provides more undergraduate housing, 60% or something, than other college colleges. I had read that somewhere. I may be wrong. But anyway, that's something that we should keep pushing UMass to do, but we don't we don't have that much control. So there's that. Um, yeah, okay, that's all for now. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Yeah, I, I know we don't, this conversation could go on literally for days, but um, so what I'm talking about is too, I'm not talking, I don't even know what goes on downtown in the middle of the night. I mean, we're not that close to downtown, but I can tell you like on uh, Sunset from Elm Street down to the university, one resident just wrote me, the Gillens, who you may know, they've lived there for 40 years. And they said that whole side of the block over a period of years went from being primarily year round residents, renters and homeowners to majority student rentals. And they, there's firecrackers going off in the middle of the night. There's parties till two in the morning at the houses. And now it's good they're taking Ubers and not driving, but they said lots of you know students you know on the street in the middle of the night waiting for their Ubers and making noise. I mean, it's a whole, if you haven't lived it, you you kind of don't, it's hard to understand, but it's again, and this these are not the, you don't see this kind of activity with graduate students. Like literally people are like, oh, the house across seats being rented to graduate students. The residents are thrilled. There is a reason that all these plans and planning and were made before Blarney blowout because there are behaviors, uh, we, many of us may have, you know, participated them ourselves between you know undergraduates of a certain age when you get a large group and as Pam said it's a tipping point if you you know I really encourage you to go to Allen, Nutting, Phillips and McClure streets which are there's maybe one family living on each block and we would just like to keep more streets throughout Amherst from from becoming those and you know, when you talk, maybe I, you know, that's UMass, there's some people say they house 40%, some say 60%, but we're in a unique situation in Amherst because we are one of the smallest towns in terms of year round population that hosts a state university. So it's a very easy, it's much more precarious where we kind of get a little out of whack. But Pat, I will send you the information on State College Pennsylvania, where they also have something called minimum distance requirements. So one way that they preserve houses for non-student households is by requiring a certain distance between, they actually define a student house, they have a certain distance between student houses, and that ensures that a certain number of houses on a block will be for non-student households. Thank you, Jennifer. Pam. Thank um, just a quick response to Shalini, actually. Um, I think as you as we get into the details of um, uh, requiring some inspections, that is something that, as, as um, Rob said earlier, it is complaint driven right now. So he doesn't really have the authority to go in and do inspections to make sure that um, you know things are in working order. 
and or so so as we as we develop a a rental permit process, one of the things that we might consider is to have um, point a point system that rewards good behavior and and uh, penalizes violations of health and safety and um, occupancy limits and things like that, which we just don't really have the staff to do right now. That was just a response to that. I, I would love to get back to the goals and just make sure that everybody feels comfortable that we're, we're actually addressing or that we want this document to whatever it becomes, we want it to address these goals. Thank you, Pam. So I, I will summarize, um, Shalini, and then I'll sum, but <laughs> I was gonna summarize and say, I've heard a lot, I've taken a lot of notes. Um, what I've heard in, in general consensus is some of the highlighted stuff that are on this screen, properly maintain code compliance homes. Um, I've, I've heard general um, desire for that to be one of the goals, like, like agreement on that one. Um, I, I've heard some some comments about equitable fee structures, but but I think that's more into the details versus just the the statement about a goal of fee structure. We need to look at it and ensure um, this one does. What I heard from some people was, you know, the way this is written incentivizes proper maintenance and lack of nuisance and behavior complaints. So I know we've got some language issues on on some on this committee with use of the word behavior, but I think what's written underneath is generally what I've heard said by this committee about the goals of um, regarding fees. Um, clear licensing, at least the green part of that, the clear licensing program, I've heard general consensus on that. Um, what's underneath, maybe we're not fully consensus on, um, but at least the 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 main part is um, the biggest problem is the safeguard strong neighborhoods because of the language around it, I think is what I've heard. Um, but, um, and then climate action goals, I heard a few committee members say that that might be something we'd like to address. Um, what I will do is attempt to come up with a document that sort of addresses this. We're not going to discuss this um, in particular to come up with an actual agreed upon document per se. Um, I will bring it up occasionally as we have time, um, but we're going to next move into, um, and, and I'll keep putting it in, in a packet. Um, so I, I don't want people to think it's not gonna show up and you'll not see anything, but, but I think some of these issues and goals will come out as we talk about the actual specifics of a residential bylaw. Um, and so, you know, there are things about, you know, so I think at, we'll, we'll have something we can sort of keep in mind as we, and have in the packet like the work plan and this one, as we go forward on some of these other issues and talk about more specifics. Um, so that's sort of my thoughts next, but Pam and then Shalini. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused about what you're, what you're thinking of for a new document that takes the goals and um, what kind of what are you thinking? <laughs> I'm not sure yet, <laughs> but I, I was thinking of, of taking what you have and then um, basically making it, I, I don't know. Let me just say, I'm not exactly sure what it'll look like and all, but I've taken good notes and I'll come up with something, but I, I think our time is better spent discussing the actual bylaw at this point than the goals, which is why I don't want to spend time on getting us to a document at this point that we can all really like say that's it, um, which is why I'm not sure what it might look like or how it might come up in the next packet at this point. So if we have ideas, we should email you and copy everybody else? Don't copy anyone else. That'd be a violation of open meeting law. We should email you. Email me and, and I will keep this on the forefront as we continue discussions. You'll see this come up on the agendas every so often. Don't worry about that. Um, but but we'll I'm still formulating exactly what will go forward with this. So that's why I'm having a hard time figuring out how to say things. Shalini. 
this is just more for the bylaw, I think, uh, the equitable fee structure that, you know, just as we consider points and all, just to keep in mind that just the fact that there is police being called because there is maybe um, disabilities or drug issues and whatnot. Uh, I mean, there are social inequities over there that people who are well off also have those issues, but they may have resources like doctors and and they may not involve calling of the police so just because this police coming in should not be a reason. I'm just putting it out there. Um, and maybe it is, and maybe there'll be Crest by then. So Crest will be looking. I'm just saying, think of the, just consider all the nuances when you think of the equity part. Um, yeah, that's all for now. Thank you. And and that that's one of the reasons I think as we get into discussions of specific things, we'll be able to flesh out some of these these issues we're having now. We're going to move on um, to the planning board appointments, um, appointment recommendations. Um, we have two things I would like to do today. One will only get done if we do the other one. So we're going to start with sufficiency of the applicant pool. There are two impending vacancies on the planning board. Um, your packet has exact ha details the number of applicants that the number of applicants we currently have because they have filled out a CAF since the um, the bulletin board notice was put forward, that number is six. And so we need to make a determination as to whether that is a sufficient number to move forward to statement, soliciting statements of interest and then scheduling interviews to, to fill these two impending vacancies, which will become actual vacancies on July 1. So we're hoping to not have any path between them. Um, before I get too far, I, I always forget before Rob leaves to thank Rob for coming and Chris for coming. I always forget it till after they've already signed off. So I'm going to try and not forget that this time. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, so so we need to decide whether six, and, and I want to say at this point, we do not talk about names. Um, Names do not get disclosed under our council policy that has been adopted on making these recommendations until the interview meeting is posted and the statements of interest are posted. And so we're basically talking about numbers right now and whether those numbers are sufficient to, do we think that's a sufficient size to give us adequate choices and make adequate recommendations to the council on planning board appointments? Um, and if we make that decision and say yes, and we're moving forward, then we're going to deal with selection guidance. So thoughts on sufficiency of the applicant pool. Shalini. A question. The, we've received these caps and have these people, because I was seeing communication was sent and all, I couldn't make out whether the what we have in terms of six is the number of people who've responded back and said yes we are is that what the cast is i was, I was so a little six, confused six is the number of so so that that document so what happens is under the current policy only those cafs that are submitted after the bulletin board notice is posted about the vacancies are considered applicants so the rest of the numbers in that, what numbers and all are the number of people, the, the policy requires that um, I or my designee for the planning board, it's me, contact all of the people who have submitted CAFs in the last two years prior to that posting to see if they're still interested and tell them if they are, they must submit a new CAF. So an email back to me saying, yes, I'm interested is not good enough. They have to submit a new CAF under the council policy. It requires me to contact um, any member of the body that we're seeking to make recommendations for whose term is expiring, because that CAF might be longer than two years old, because a lot of these terms are three years, um, to, to seek their interest and tell them if they are interested, they must submit a CAF. And so, so a lot of those numbers in that document are saying, here's how many people I contacted because they, we had CAFs more than up to two years old. And here's how many I heard that said, no, I'm not interested. So they didn't submit a CAF, but they, they contacted me back. And I thought that was nice information for the committee to hear. Um, those that I never heard back from, and then those that the I, I either heard back from 
uh, th those that I heard back from, and I put that in quotes because the reason I heard back from was they submitted a new calf. Um, so that's where that information is. But the, the number we're looking at is six. That is, if we move forward, those are the only individuals I will be contacting from here on out are those six. Unless another CAF is submitted, because any CAF submitted up until when we post that statements of interest for the interviews is considered a candidate too. So it doesn't close the applicant pool at six, but it starts us on the next process forward if we determine that the pool is sufficient today. Jennifer. Okay, so I just want to make sure I'm correlating the right. It was the six, and then there was um, um, a document that was more uh, that wasn't yet for the public as it had names. And it was the ones in green, the green boxes that it submitted. So yes. where I think that six could be enough applicants for two spots to consider the green, it, there didn't seem to be much diversity. And we always, that's, that's always a concern, right? Um, which is why we have to look at the CAFs to determine is, is six the number and given where they are, do we want to continue on um, given all of that. And so I would think we would. Pam. Um, as in what would be the alternative to continuing on if we decided we <laughs> if we don't, we have to recruit more, right? That's that's the alternative to not make to saying the pool is not sufficient is we don't move on until we get more calves um, and we recruit more. So in the past, it is it is usual for this committee to say we have enough to move to interview interviews, but we are still not happy with the diversity of the pool. That is a lot of what we say all the time. <laughs> just just for for people that have not been this before and and we're working it's it's actually slightly more diverse than it's been in the past um but it's still not obviously where we would like it to be um other thoughts so seeing none i'm just going to make the motion to declare the applicant pool um, for the planning it. board, no, I don't know, Shalini was speaking, to declare <laughs> the applicant pool for the planning board sufficient to continue on in the process. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. And I, I do want to say one other thing. Um, in the past, we have made this determination and then so if applicants don't, if the applicants we have now do not submit a statement of interest by the deadline that, that will be created, they are no longer in the applicant pool. There has been in the past situations where we've made the determination of sufficiency and then that deadline hit. And then I came back to the committee and said, here's what we got, here's our impending vacancies, what are we gonna do? And we then declared the pool insufficient anymore. Um, so this is not the only time, we, we can always back away from this and say, you know what? it's not sufficient anymore. Um, so, you know, cause, cause that happens. So I just wanted to let people know that that's happened in the past. Um, any other comments, Jennifer? So it means that we will move forward to um, try, you know, to make, extend the invitation to interview these candidates and we will still keep doing outreach. Yes. Yeah. Pam. I'm going to ask a related question that may not be the topic, and that is that some people have at least expressed uh, interest in the ZBA and, and the planning board. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that perhaps if all six can't be appointed to the two positions, that there may be a few people that would be willing and interested in pursuing ZBA. So we would have a, a fairly tight fit of a parallel track with the ZBA process as well, given that everybody everybody needs to be appointed by July 1. Is that correct? Yeah, these processes tend to move somewhat in parallel. The reason ZBA is not in front of us today is um, because in, in my determination, 
it wasn't even a question as to whether the pool was sufficient. I believe there are exactly three applicants right now for two full membership, two full impending vacancies and four associate impending vacancies. And so um, I made the determination that that wasn't even worth bringing to us for that determination at this time. Now, at some point we might have to make that consideration to make sure that the fulls do not go vacant as of July 1. Um, but but I thought we still had a little bit more time to try and continue recruiting ZBA before we have to make a decision that might not be as easily made as six for two slots are for planning board potentially. Um, so I, I will keep working with Pam on that one on on when we bring that forward. But they do kind of move in parallel slots. Um, I'm going to take the vote. Uh, we're starting with myself. I'm an I. Uh, Pam. I. Jennifer. I. Shalini. Yes. Pat. I. That is five to zero. The pool is sufficient. That means we are moving on to the um, the the selection guidance, and this is um, basically two parts, and and hopefully will not take long because we're almost out of time. Um, the first part is um, the pulled directly from the policy. That's the part that you had in the draft selection guidance. It's pulled exactly from the policy that the council has adopted. Um, and the second part is generally, um, which I left blank um, because I did not have the guidance when I posted that document um, as I get to to pulling some of these up is the input from the chair. And I gave you in the packet a couple of examples of inputs from the chair. So section A is pulled from the policy. So since that's the policy wording, I recommend we do not change it <laughs> because that's the town council policy. Section B is what we would add from the planning board chair. There is a separate PDF document in the in the packet of hey, what Andy. the plan. Andy, sorry. Yeah? sorry. I had to verbally interrupt. Um, so are we talking about the uh, 3D guidance, uh, planning board selection guidance draft 2022-0406? Is that the document that you're actually referring to now? So we're talking about this document. Oh, okay. It's left blank in B. Okay. So A comes from the policy. Yep. Verbatim. B is where we normally in, input the bodies, the, 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 in, the we, in, we put in and copy in the input we received from the chair of the committee, which would be um, the planning board's chair. That input was received in a PDF, so I have not copied it over yet, um, but that PDF is in the packet. Um, in past, CRC members, CRC has decided sometimes to take it verbatim, other times it has not. Um, the easiest is to take it verbatim unless there are any concerns about the verbatim wording. Um, and then if there are some concerns, then we sometimes summarize things and, and do other things, but we do not have to take it verbatim. Um, I, I thought, personally, I thought Doug's input was very thoughtful. Um, I, I don't know what anyone else thinks. The easiest thing for me to do would take it verbatim, but I'll do whatever the committee wants. <laughs> Basically, so thoughts on section B input from the body's chair, what should be added into it? Pat? Yeah, I think Doug's uh, recommendations were thoughtful, but I, um, and I can't remember and I don't, I don't have it pulled up and I can see that you're doing that. One of the things that we are, really need to work on is getting diverse candidates uh, and getting people with different kinds of experience. So somehow or other, um, I know these are qualifications, uh, but I wonder if somewhere in there, this document, there shouldn't be a statement about um, the importance of diverse candidates. And I'm not sure how I would phrase it or anything or exactly where it would go, but... Um, So we have it in section A from the policy. It's not as um, probably bold. Maybe we could yeah, work on it a little. We could, 
we could potentially add something else somewhere. Um, Yeah, and I'm sorry I didn't I didn't think about it in advance, uh, but it it's um, yeah. what I could do is you know the the question is does that pertain to selection guidance or does that pertain to you uh, know yeah, the importance of having diverse candidates is not in in my mind not necessarily pertaining to the selection guidance of who to recommend versus. Yes to us as counselors doing our job. Um, so I can add it to things like our committee reports of we are still not succeeding in our goal as a council. Um, and we have to find other ways to better obtain diverse candidates than what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts on selection guidance? Would people be happy? Would would people be okay if I just put um, the chair's PDF document essentially into this under section B, Pam? Yeah. Why don't you just attach it? Um, it seemed like I mean Doug was looking again at um, not necessarily our intent, but certain qualifications, which are which are wonderful. It doesn't mean that everyone has to have all of those qualifications to be a good planning board member. Right. So um, um, I think I think there was nothing wrong with the qualifications that he that he laid out. So you know we have them. That's great. They may not fit every candidate. Other thoughts, Shalini. Yeah, I would, I, I support putting his letter in and I thought his minimum qualifications are fairly open. They're not like limited to being an engineer. That, that was an additional point he made later, but the minimum qualifications like fair and open. And I think an important one, which I don't know if you've considered that in our questions that we ask, which is willing to reconsider previous positions when presented with new information. To me, that's a very important criteria, actually. And we've never included that in our selection criteria or mm. the questions that we ask. And I think that's where I feel most frustrated sometimes personally is that I, that we are sharing information. Yeah, I don't know if this is the place, but just to say that this is an important uh, quality in a candidate to be able to really listen, digest, and be able to either shift their position or be able to speak to it. And so, yeah, just saying that I like what he's proposed. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Yeah, I, um, this is um, more intangible, but so I don't know if we can really include it. Maybe it's just more something to keep in mind as we interview candidates, but um, I think it's important to have members of the planning board who represent different perspectives. I guess I have felt that, yeah, that there's been very little uh, diversity in kind of points of view or but it's all, so that, that, and that I think leads to a lot of, I don't know, like six to one votes. Thank you, Jennifer. Pat? Uh, yeah, number, um... Five, the an understanding of the town system of governance boards and committees. <laughs> I wouldn't be a, a counselor if I had to live up to that qualification. I mean, I was a town meeting member for a short period of time, but it didn't help me really understand what the hell was going on. Um, and I think that there's something about that. It, maybe it needs to be refer or uh, an understanding of or willingness to learn because because um, that would preclude a lot of people. I think, oh, I don't know anything about how this, the committee system works and I don't know. So, or a willingness to learn would satisfy my concern. Okay. So I can add that in um, to, to when I put this into the input from the chair, I can add that language into it. Um, if I see nods from many others. Um, okay. So I, I will do that. 
um, and all. And so at this point, I don't have a document for us to vote on, even though we're supposed to vote, but I'm just going to note in the, I think we're supposed to vote it, um, but I will note in our, um, in the report that we reached consensus on what to include, I will bring this document back so people can see it. I will put it in the next packet, but um, I, I will at least create it, put it in the next packet and be able to send this out. This goes out to the candidates when I so solicit the statements of interest. I may not do that immediately because I have to figure out things like when the interviews are, um, which you'll get some polls on to, to, to see when we should do them. Um, we have to try it, you know, so so it might take me a little bit to move to that section, um, but, but I will note that we've reached consensus on what to include. I will make that change on this one. Um, thank you for all of that. Um, and let's see, where is my agenda? Um, we have two things to do. Hopefully they will be quick. Um, the first one is um, general public comment before we close out our meeting. Um, if there is any, we will, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC will be taken at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to one, up to three minutes. Um, and so if you'd like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Seeing none. Um, we are going to do minutes. Um, I'm going to move to adopt the March 31, 2020 meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Cal. Are there any comments? Seeing none, we're going to vote. We're starting with uh, Pam, I think. Are we up to you? Yes. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Shalini? Yes. Uh, Pat. Hi. And Mandy is an I. They are adopted unanimously. Um, I had a draft next agenda preview on this. I have no idea if it's going to stay the same. So <laughs> I no, doubt no. flood maps will be on it. I doubt flood maps will be on it. Flood maps need a hearing and all. Um, and so we will, I think, have them referred to us by the next meeting, but they will not be on the next meeting. Um, and so we'll see, you know, historic structures will or will not based on what I hear from the historical commission as to their readiness based on their discussion given given some things. So I, I will think about it and figure it out and get back to you guys, you'll see it then. Um, I'll talk to Dave and Pam to see what else. Um, so yeah, um, any other announcements, agenda items or unanticipated items? Seeing none, thank you all for moving through this very packed agenda, basically on time. I really appreciate it. It helps us move things forward. And so I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 6.38 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Dave and Athena. Yeah. Yes. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.